Jerusalem. Its name resonates in the hearts of Christians, Jews and Muslims alike and echoes through centuries of shared and disputed history. Jerusalem has been called the holiest city in the world, even the eternal city. First built over 4,000 years ago, its history can be heard in the whispering of the wind along the walls, where every stone tells a wondrous story of a city that has drawn millions of pilgrims for thousands of years. Come with me on a journey, the quest for answers, looking for Jesus in the Holy Land. Jerusalem is located along the central mountain ridge of Palestine, 58 kilometers east of the Mediterranean and 26 kilometers west of the northern tip of the Dead Sea. The city is situated approximately 700 meters above sea level on the relatively level plateau of the Benjaminite Highlands. Jerusalem was originally a Jebusite city occupied by Israel at the time of David. At this stage, it became the capital city of Israel. The ancient city is bounded on the east by the Kidron Valley, which separates it from the Mount of Olives, and on the west and south by the Hinnom Valley. On the Mount of Olives, there is found a peaceful garden surrounding an olive grove called the Garden of Gethsemane. Its name comes from the Hebrew Gat, Sheman, meaning oil press. The garden, about 1,200 square meters in area, was well known to the disciples as it was close to the natural route from the temple to the summit of the Mount of Olives and the ridge leading to Bethany. Though the Franciscan, Russian, Armenian, and Greek Orthodox churches have all claimed otherwise, the precise location of Gethsemane remains a matter of conjecture. These are the famous olive trees by the Church of All Nations with their hollow and twisted trunks. The trees are more than three meters in diameter, some of them. Recent studies indicate that they're 900 years old. They were placed here during the Crusader period in the 12th century. Interestingly, scientists have discovered that the eight oldest olive trees are siblings. They all have the same DNA, indicating that they came from cuttings of the same mother tree. These ancient olive trees may actually be the daughters of a tree that witnessed Christ's agony right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane was well known to Jesus and his disciples. They had often retreated to this place for meditation and prayer. But that night was different. That night, the disciples noticed a significant change came over Jesus. Never before had they seen him so utterly sad and silent. He said to the disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. Peter, James, and John were his closest earthly friends. If there was ever a time when he needed them, it was now. Yet he could not bear to have them see him in that dark hour. So he went a little further, about a stone's throw away, according to Luke 22:41, and collapsed onto the cold, damp ground. He prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. The cup he was praying about was the cross. Jesus shrank back from the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. The sins of the world, my sins and yours, were separating Jesus from the Father there in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his agony, Jesus clung to the cold, damp ground as if to prevent himself from being drawn farther away from the Father. Jesus longed for the support of his closest friends. He longed to hear some words of comfort from those uh, whom he had so often comforted. Suffering as he was, Jesus needed to know that Peter, James, and John were praying for him and for themselves. But they were sleeping. The Bible says they were exhausted from their sorrow. Jesus woke them. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Seized with agony, fainting and exhausted, Jesus staggered back to his prayer rock. His suffering was even more intense than before. The Bible says, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. There's a medical condition called uh, hematidrosis, where a person who is under extreme stress actually sweats blood. As Christ agonized in the garden that night, bloody sweat dripped from his face. We will never fully understand the agony of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Again, he prayed, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Hear the submission in Christ's prayer. If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, may your will be done. Again, Jesus longed for the companionship and support of his closest disciples. Again, he went to them and again he found them sleeping. Mark 14 says that when he came back and again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy, they did not know what to say to him. They were speechless. And so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time saying the same thing. I want to read a paragraph to you from a favorite book of mine on the life of Christ. It's entitled The Desire of Ages. The author describes what Jesus was going through as he prayed that third time. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not now for his disciples that their faith might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul. The awful moment had come, that moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. Christ might even now refuse to drink the cup apportioned to guilty man. It was not yet too late. He might wipe the bloody sweat from his brow and leave man to perish in his iniquity. He might say, let the transgressor receive the penalty of his sin, and I will go back to my Father. Will the Son of God drink the bitter cup of humiliation and agony? Will the innocent suffer the consequences of the curse of sin to save the guilty? The words fall tremblingly from the pale lips of Jesus. O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. Three times Jesus uttered that prayer. Three times he submitted himself to the Father's will. He knew that without his sacrifice, mankind must perish. And here in the garden, Jesus made his decision. He would save us at any cost to himself. He could have walked away. He didn't have to go through with it. But here in the garden, he chose to drink the cup. Luke 22 tells us that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. 
rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. It was at this point that Judas showed up, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches and lanterns, swords and clubs. Judas had prearranged a signal with them. He told them, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him. The Sanhedrin was looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could condemn him to death. Many false witnesses came forward, but their testimonies contradicted each other. Finally, in frustration, Caiaphas, the high priest, said to Jesus, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest, in horror, tore his clothes, declared Jesus guilty of blasphemy, and the council condemned him to death. Then they spit in his face, struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Meanwhile, Peter was warming himself by the fire in the courtyard. Luke's gospel tells us that a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked at him closely and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Let's consider what took place here in the garden that night. Gethsemane became more than a garden where Jesus and his men spent some time. On that night, Gethsemane became a place where eternal business was transacted for the glory of God. On that night, Gethsemane became a place of pressure, a place of prayer, and a place of priorities. As you know, the name Gethsemane means olive press, Gethsemane was and is a place where olive trees grew and produced their fruit. The olives were collected, placed in a press, and the precious olive oil was extracted from the olives under intense pressure. On that night, Jesus entered the olive press and the sweet oil of grace and submission to the Father was extracted from the Lord's life. For Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane was a place of intense pressure. The Bible tells us. Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John with him and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, stay here 
and watch. The Word of God tells us that Jesus was overwhelmed emotionally and spiritually by what he experienced. As he entered the Garden of Gethsemane that night, think about the intense pressure the Lord was under. The thoughts of what he was about to endure literally overwhelm his mind and his heart. It was a time of extreme pressure. Thank God that he endured the spiritual and emotional trials and made it to Calvary so that we might be saved. On that night, Gethsemane became a place of priorities. Jesus prioritized God's will over His will. On that night, Jesus put first His mission over His well-being. In Gethsemane, He prioritized your life over His life. He could have walked away from us that night. No one was forcing Him to die. No one was forcing Him to become sin for us. No one was forcing Him to do what He did. He did it willingly. He did it so that we might have a way to be saved. He did it so that when a lost soul cried out to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ, the Savior, there would be salvation available. He did it because He loves you and me. I am thankful that He endured the pain and paid the price so that we might be saved. There's good evidence that the Church of St. Peter in Denial is situated on the exact location where Peter denied Jesus three times. Archaeologists have confirmed that this is indeed where the high priest's home was. When Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, he was led up these very steps to be tried by the Sanhedrin. This artwork depicts Peter's threefold denial of Christ. Notice the rooster up top. All of us can relate to Peter. We've all denied Christ. Think about what it must have been like for Peter when the rooster crowed. The Bible says the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Their eyes met. Jesus knew Peter had denied him three times. What do you think Peter saw in Jesus' eyes? I'll tell you what I think Peter saw. I think he saw deep pity and sorrow. It was a look of compassion a look of forgiveness, but there was no anger there. Why do I believe that's what Peter saw in Jesus' eyes? I believe it because the Bible indicates that Christ's love is an unconditional love. His love for us does not change when we mess up like Peter did. Friend, Jesus knew that Peter would deny him, and he still loved Peter. Jesus knew everything about him, and he still loved him. Friend, Jesus knows you too. He knows all about you. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, and He still loves you. It's called grace. Some people stay away from God because they think God's mad at them. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that God is mad at you because of your sins? I want to assure you today, God is not mad at you. He loves you. He knows all about you and He still loves you. You can trust a God like that. Please, open your heart to Him today. Sometimes we can feel distance from God through our conscious awareness of sin. But God's forgiveness is greater than our sin. Jesus accepted your sin, and in Gethsemane, He chose to die in your place as your Savior. This should give us hope to look beyond ourselves to the richness of God's grace and His mercy. I Still Care For You is a song that the Lord gave me early in my walk with Him. I had so much to unlearn. I had so much to surrender. But as the Lord has been kind and patient with me, so He will extend grace and forgiveness to you. Why? 
simply because he cares for you. Yes, he cares for you. Tell me, Lord, will you always be there? Tell me, Lord, do you really care? Tell me, Lord, do you really love me? Do you accept me? Can you set me free? Little child, I will always be true. It's okay because I love you. Dry your eyes, there's no need to despair. You're my child and I still care for you. Father, help me to be strong. Lord, you know how much I long to be found within your will. Is it true? Do you love me still? Tell me, Lord, will you always be true? Even though you know I hurt you. Lord, you know how that I've done you wrong. Yet you know that I long for you. For you. Lift your eyes, there's no need to be sad. I forgive you, won't you? Come and be glad I can help you in your battle with sin Let me help you, we can try it again Little child, I will always be true It's okay, because I love you Dry your eyes, there's no need to be spared You're my child and I still care Little child, I will always be true It's okay because I died for you Dry your eyes, there's no need to despair You're my child and I still care for you For you Thank you, Pastor Ron. Now, let's pray. Father in heaven, your son took all the pressure, all the sin upon himself. And now we can live and live forever. May each one of us accept this gift. In Jesus name we pray, amen.
dear friend, thank you so much for watching us today. Don't forget to share the quest for answers, looking for Jesus in the Holy Land with your friends and relatives. Please visit our website. On our website, you can leave us a message, your prayer requests, and order a copy of today's show or the complete series. If you feel moved to support our ministry, you can make your donation on our website as well. I hope to see you soon. Until then, remember, Jesus is love.